Good evening. We are live once again. Uh, joining me in a second will be Mike McShane. Uh, my name is Alex Lane, uh, chairing this panel. And if you've got any questions for Mike, then please put them into the comments and we will ask the best ones of him. In fact, it's getting late and we're getting a bit freewheeling. We might even ask a few of the weird ones as well, because they've been coming in all day. Uh, so don't forget that uh, this uh, edition of the online Who at Hoylake Festival is in... Um, is uh, being run for a benefit of uh, mind. Uh, keep your donations coming in. We've gone over the 300 quid mark, which is amazing. Uh, you can donate via PayPal at paypal.me forward slash WAH2020. And we'll put that up and the QR code uh, towards the end of the show as well. Uh, so now, uh, please welcome uh, my guest for this hour, Mr. Mike McShane. Hello. Hey, guys. How's it going? What's up, Alex? Good. Excellent. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, I'm really, really, really giddy and excited about this interview because it's not very often you get to interview somebody who's been in three of your all-time favorite tv shows ever mm. uh so doctor who obviously um uh, that's a that's a reason why you're here um whose line is it anyway which we'll come <laughs> on to uh nah, nah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, al but also uh, not talked about nearly enough uh, you popped up in an episode of frasier yes i did yes i did you um, were showed Niles Crane around the Shangri La. I did. It was it was um that was a trip, you know, um to be on that show to be because I've been in Seinfeld as well as Frasier to be on the sets of those shows, which are iconic looking sets. Mm. Um, and the cast of Frasier was, without exception, really great. Uh, Kelsey didn't hang much with this. He went in the beginning. He's all very that's you know he's very politest about it, and then he goes off by himself. But mm. working with him was great. Um, it was a, you know, it was cool. just a great, it was a great gig. The best, the best green room really? of any studio in Hollywood I've ever been in. It was like huge. Well, next like to Seinfeld. Seinfeld had a, a cereal bar because that's what I ate. So this long thing with different boxes of cereal on it. So, so what was on offer in the Frasier green room? It was just really soft and comfortable furniture and all these photos of all the guest stars. Uh, they put up, and so they took my shot, you know, in the same in uh, the dad in John Mahoney's chair, and then oh. they put that up. And so you're looking at, and you know, you recognize the big names, and you go, "Hey, there's buddy I did rep with," and that, nah, nah, you know, and it's you can do that there because I'm the kind of actor that irritates people like my wife, who's who's an academic, who's not in the business, but um, we'll go to see a movie, you know, <laughs> a suspenseful moment. I go, "Hey, look, it's Chuck." You know, I did Mary Wise and when she's like, "Really? That's what you're going to talk about now?" Shut <laughs> up, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I just like seeing my friends working. Yeah, well, well, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, say um, if you have a question for Mike at all uh, about anything, uh, Doctor Who related, of course, but but anything else as well, uh, then uh, then let us know. Uh, Rachel B uh, commented before the show even started, um, which just which just shows the draw that you have. Uh, she puts, I'll donate some extra cash if Mike blows me a kiss. And I did. Which we were off air, unfortunately. So yes. yeah, that, that was practice run. If kids want air buses from me for donations to mine, please. I've got kisses oh plenty. Filtered okay. through this weird mustache, which I'm trying right. to cut down. I have an audition for a next year Christmas movie. And uh, I kind of, oh, I'm going to shave it. I go, no, nah, I need to keep it. Because, you know, just because I'm old and fat, they go, can he play Santa? Oh, he's got a beard. Yes. Sometimes <laughs> it's funny you audition for stuff and you have to dress up and you go, but wait, isn't this like the world of imagination? When I go to an audition, do I have to look like a doctor? Do I have to carry a briefcase and playing a lawyer? Can you just imagine that? I mean, unless it's a prop I need to do something with. And I'm often always stunned by, you know, no, we need you to look like. So auditioning for Doctor Who must be great, you know. When was the first time you saw Doctor Who? Oh, yes. Yeah, so that's 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 literally just come in. Wow. Uh, speaking. I, I was gotten out of the army in seventy six or seventy seven, and I uh, was living in Stockton, in the Central Valley of California, kind of a hippie. And I lived in a commune. We didn't have a TV. Mm -hmm. And um, two doors down. Um, there was a kid, he was mildly autistic, and he was a huge fan of Doctor Who and Star Trek. And so we would watch those occasionally. And um, 
because I, I knew the Star Trek pretty well, that, that you know, world. And so he said, have you ever seen Doctor Who? And, and I went, oh, no, you know. And uh, he, we turned on, we watched um, The Face of Evil. So The Face of Evil. And um, later when I saw the first Star Trek, the Vigor thing, I went, God, these guys are like borrow. It's great the width of what they borrow, with, you know, and you do. I mean, I, I remember Face of Evil, and then I watched, um, I rewatched actually a couple of days ago because I like that season. Yes, I love it. Why is it Matt Smith? It is Matt Smith. He's my favorite. But running a close second is Tom Baker because before I ever worked in England or met the British, he to me expressed uh, a sort of British thing. It's like they're like, they're impatient and they kind of get in your face, but they like forget it. They're like, you know, what's the president? Why are you asking me that? And then they move on. <laughs> it's like, he's so peremptory with people, but everybody gets him a break because he's not really unpleasant because he's very curious and he poses. And I guess in the long run, he had a philosophy that's not akin to uh, what I feel in improv. He go, Oh, I made a mistake. I'm like, don't make a mistake. That's intelligence. You know, he, 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 the character would espouse that some of the, uh, clumsy parts of being a human being are the best parts of you. And that, you know, when, and that the, the stuff that they're fighting against are the worst parts are surety and dominion and domination and things like that. So it, I really appreciate he had a, a form of, he was humane, but in a really weird way, you know? And then of course I came to England. Like, oh, let's see, that's British people. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Was um, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so was 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 Doctor Who the classic series uh, shown in America pre Tom Baker, or, or was that the sort of time when it started to take if hold? It was I didn't really know that then because we didn't have this to expand. You have to go to probably specialist places um, mm -hmm. like comic book shops. Then again, they were really small, so. You know, the internet has put this great high production light on weird nerd corners of the world where in the old days it was just, you know, some 350 pound fat guy that looked like me as a stoner going, dude, you know, I'm an old, old high Gallifreyan, want some of some, you know, blue targets, <laughs> you know, and um, which would be great. We have dispensaries in California. If somebody grows something that calls a blue targets, they could sell it, you know. Um, <laughs> Nice. Uh, that's a strain waiting to happen if it hasn't already. It should. Uh, it should. You can get some to. Um, oh God, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm. I'm not quite awake yet for some reason. Um, so, so you're you're in. You say you're in LA at, at the moment. Yes, I'm uh, in LA. Yeah. What time is it where you are? It is eleven nineteen. Cool. Eleven nineteen. Uh, have you been in America throughout all of the pandemic and, and lockdown? Or yeah, I have. I have been here in LA and stayed uh, and stayed and in, um, inside. Um, you know, I have a my my um, wife has an autoimmune disease, so I have to really mind my p's and q's about that stuff. You know, and um, you know, it's it's kind of rough for that. You know, I like to get out and I get I get edgy. Yeah. You know, I get, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to figure out the one doctor I worked with him. Scottish. He's a Scottish fellow. Uh, Peter Capaldi. No, no, not, not Peter Capaldi. He was the, he was the one that when, you know, in the history of your, of the show, the one when they stopped Doctor Who because they said it was too. Sylvester McCoy. Sylvester McCoy. Yes. Lovely. Yeah, and, and sorry, I just this this comes from being an old stoner. Um, <laughs> You're in good company, but, but it was great because he's like he's an old Scottish hippie, basically. Yes, and and I and I did a tour of Little Shop of Horrors with him, and he was so much fun to be with. I started calling him the Good Time Lord, um, because he was just he was just a delight, and had all these stories, and was really warm, and you know and when you you know you're you're on the road with somebody and everything's good. And you're being taken well care of, but you're on the road. You want to be able to get along with them. You're on the road. And that was a great cast to be on the road with him. He was just a wealth of information. And, uh, and then talk to him about, you know, that time when you're in, you know, you have as an actor, you don't have no agency. Once you get into a role in a certain mm -hmm. area where you, you've got to do what they say. You're, it's your job. 
And if the writing, if they've gotten tired of it or the budgets drop and people move away from it or, or something and the quality's moved past and you're coming into these like prestige legacy shows and you're going, well, why is it worth, you know, and then you get to blame, especially if they're the lead. You're like, you suck. And it's like, well, maybe you don't suck. Maybe it just, they got tired of it and it needed to be rebranded, you know, and it needed to come around again. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's cool. And, and, and he, he was really sanguine about it. I was like, that, that's really, you know, he didn't, you know, didn't, wasn't like a bitter actor. <laughs> um, uh, so how does um, being an improviser help with acting? Does it help? It does help. It does help in the process. Um, in the old earlier days, sometimes you might get somebody who's like, well, you know, he's going to change the lines. It's like, no, no, I don't. Look, I'm a repertory theater actor. Um, I, that's how I started out. You know, I was in a Shakespeare company with Annette Bening and, when I was younger. And, um, and you know, I'm not going to jerk around with that. And I'm not going to jerk around with your script. If you open the door up and ask for suggestions or if you're cool with it and, we, you know, you've got a, a rapport, then, you know, you might get, get some material that you, you add and tag on to it and build. But I'm not going to drive through and change it. I worked with an actor who's famous, I'm pretty nameless. He just, he would like change, he would take all your punchlines and recon, because he just was a stand up and reshape them. So he was funny and you weren't. And after a while, I was like, man, I can't, just, I can't win here, can I? Because he was a star, he could come in and grab that. I've mm -hmm. never been in a position to do that. But improv, I'll tell you one thing I like with improv. I improvise sometimes if I have what's called a deadline where it's like, let's get them, you know? And it, 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 it and, you know, after all, you say it a hundred times, it doesn't mean anything. You kind of think of a thought in your mind, the statement before, like, these guys are going to eat my wife. Let's get them. And you don't say, these guys are going to eat my wife. So when it comes out of your mouth, the thought is in it. So what you're saying is occupied with a position other than just an attitude. There's a stake or something. And then you can tone it down. Throw it goes, no, that was too big. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, let's see. Uh, what was the process of getting the part in Doctor Who? Um, was it a round of auditions or are you specifically asked? I was asked. I was very fortunate. I was asked. I, that blew me away. Um, I was back here in the States and, and, and my agent called up. And she said, you know, they'd like you to do a Doctor Who. And I'm like, Martin, that's, that's easy. Um, and um, But then I had to go and do some of the homework to know about the Weeping Angels. Yes. And how that had come from a child's game. I was told, you know, where you, you turn your back to somebody and they walk towards you. And when you mm -hmm. turn around and freeze and you play this game, where you turn back. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I guess it was the concept of it came from uh, it because you're dealing with speculative fiction. It's a room full of people speculating off of their own wealth of, of love for all these films. Um, well, the Robots of Death, which is like based on an Agatha Christie. Yeah. Because you get a murder. The murder happens and then everybody's like blaming each other. And it's like, mm -hmm. and when you see that one, they're all rather, they're very Agatha Christie, all with this weird makeup. And they're in the outer space where they're going, hey, well, of course you'd say that. And you, what do you mean? I'm kidding. You're like they're being patting <laughs> each other on a, on a, what is it, like a churning, a dirt churning space pod, you know? <laughs> uh, so how um, um, did you, when you were doing the, the, the research for the part in Dot Two, did you uh, know how significant the story was, was going to be? Because it was Amy and Rory's last. I know. I did not really comprehend that because I'd watched a couple, um, but the, the 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 richness of that part of the story wasn't apparent to me. You know, um, I just, you know, when they said Julius Curl's a collector of, you know, um, of objects of the art and strange arcane objects, um, and because of my size, I'm like, do you want me to? I said, well, how about if they were like Sydney Green Street? They went, yeah, that's good. Because I think that's what they were thinking for the Maltese Falcon. So it was just very, you know, that boat of me sort of, uh, you know, and then deadly at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, what I was disappointed in, in my, my episode is in the end, I actually, my punishment is I get stuck in a painting. They take me, the Reaping Angels, like, transmogrify me into a painting of a, a, a Chinese slave pottery thing. And they showed me the picture, and I was going to be in it, in like a loincloth. And, um, you know, I wish I would have known about the talents of Wing Chun, because I would just start improvising, like, hey, guys, sorry about that. I mean, we didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know. 
Uh, so have you um have you played uh, the bad guy a lot? Was this your first time? As I've gotten older, I start doing a fine line of awful white men. I, you know, I feel like I should get like a, a Victorian card. You know, I make me shame, but they have terrible Caucasians. <laughs> Uh, which deeply fun is funny. I'm, I find that amusing because mm. I'm adopted. Actually, my mother was a uh, um, uh, Ojibwe, uh, full Ojibwe Indian from Canada, obviously, and the other half of me is Scottish. Mm -hmm. Don't you know? Um, so, um, but the fact you know that I uh, I often play really bad, not bad guy, but dicks basically. <laughs> You know, like in Wayward Pines, I played a, a real weird jerk. Um, mm. I guess that's maybe the tone of my voice and maybe, you know. But uh, when I was much bigger, it was very comic. And then as I took some weight off, then I'd fall into those roles. But I like playing rogues. I, I, I did Falstaff when I was younger and uh, did Henry Four One and Two and, and Mary Wives. And I love that character. And so there's always room for that kind of guy who's, well, as my director said, Falstaff was the perfect anarchist. He knows all law, all order, and religion that he may break. All law, order, and religion. And if you apply that template generally, which American actor, male or female, would you think, wow, well, first to pose Good this question. provocative first statement, which American actor, because it is, as much as, you know, fair play and stuff, the creation of Doctor Who is a and you guys all know this, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, is quintessentially British, uh, late colonial explorer with a heart, like Lionel Jeffries was in The First Man in the Moon mm -hmm. and The Doctor and um, Quatermass in the Pit. They, they belong to science. They belong to a sort of rationale, and, but they have an extremely humane core that runs through. Them. And, and in the case of The First Man in the Moon, which, oh, I was in love with that movie as a kid. I love George Bell films, and I loved uh, uh, the guy who played uh, Lionel Jeffries. I adored him. Um, that he, the way he sacrifices himself, and Queer Master Pity sacrifices himself, you know. And so that has a has a richness that American science fiction, of course, is like. Are these the aliens? Let's shoot them. <laughs> shoot first, colonize later. Ask questions when they act up, which um, so. With a with a the the best sort of well-meaning, you know. Okay, you guys are gonna hit through this. I think in some ways, the softness of Keanu Reeves, because you're gonna make him American, make him American, you know. Hmm. And and he's familiar with time travel now, anyway, um, as Bill and Ted um, is. Right. But he has a benevolence, a soft American benevolence, like you know. I mean, the door kicking open of the TARDIS and going, "Yo, Daleks." Be most excellent to each other, you know. Which <laughs> might make people lose their minds, but to get a richness of you, could, you'd have, I think you'd have to get a good John Lithgow. Yes, good, good shout, good shout. I, 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 I always thought that uh, Doc Brown in in Back to the Future couldn't True happen too. without Doctor Who. Is there something very er erratic and doctory uh, about that character? So yes. I, I, I forget the guy's name. The actual yes. lady. And so it's a female, a female mm. American. You know what? I'd actually just like to see Annette Benning do Doctor Who. Annette Benning is, you know, I've known her God, since I was in my 20s. And I mean, and she got huge and we're so, but she's a pragmatic, good hearted person, but it's like low on the bullshit. She's not a real lovey that way. And she never mm. was like that, even in the beginning. Mm -hmm. When we started out, but she's got a decency to her. If you see the American President, uh, where she plays that uh, yes. with uh, Michael Douglas, yeah, she yeah. has a real decent core and and a morality that stands from like well, let's do the decent thing, you know. Cool. And uh, so I think she would be a really great Doctor Who. Thank thank you, Erica, for looking up. It was Christopher Lloyd who I couldn't remember. Lloyd, who played, yes, who played Doc Brown. Um, Where I, we're I, going, we won't need you know. Yeah, I, I always thought Brian Cranston as well uh, from Breaking Bad. I thought that there's there's a there's a certain he has there's a range of for going from very very nice and sweet to very very sinister, which I think could could suit the Doctor. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think he could, and in mm -hmm. a way, he's he's very American, whereas 
John Lithgow has the, the East Coast Yankee factor, which kind of gives you that set, a little bit of the British tone to it. Hence mm. his, his success in the UK, playing, you know, more yes. the ultimate. Churchill. You know, Churchill and all that. Um, yeah. But that's a good one. And Cranston's a really good actor and a really nice man. Mm. So well, keep your uh, questions coming in uh, for Mike. If you are um, putting a question in on Facebook, for some reason, it's not showing up your name. So if you include your name in the text as well. Uh, well, there's only junior. Yeah, there's wit. Yeah. You got wit in there. Yeah, it's just showing up as a Facebook user. Um, so a uh, bit about um, whose line is it anyway, uh, which you want to come to. Yes. Uh, so how did that come about? Um, what were you doing um, at the time? I was uh, me and, and Greg Proops uh, and a guy named Brian Lohman, Reed Rollman, Sandy Althaus, and Kathy Arcoli were in an improv group called Fault Line. And it was, um, I, I, I was always very, you know, I, I suffered from that Midwestern thing of I wanted to be an actor, but, you know, the Midwestern was like, well, that's not a job for a real human being, dressing up and making fun and offending your people. Well, you know, grow up, get a, be a mechanic. Um, <laughs> and so I got out of the army. I was knocking around and I got involved in that. And so I moved to San Francisco, went to college with proofs. Um, and um, he was in an improv group and I sat in once and it didn't hook me. It didn't hook me at all. I had a good time, but it didn't, you know, it was just like skitty. I was playing the skits and, you know, and at that time we realized uh, the book Impro had come out. So the, the British sort of point of view that Keith Johnstone was 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 intriguing us because it was slightly theatrical, more narrative, uh, you know, and so once I was I was knocking around doing odd jobs, doing theater here and there, and Greg called me up. He's like, dude, we're going to start an improv group in San Francisco off the, out of the co college, away from the college. And he goes, you want to be in it? I'm like, uh, I don't know. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, we're not going to make any money. It's a lot of time. And I'd rather try to find a job, you know, during the evening doing theater, you know, theater, theater, and then working, you know, I worked in a warehouse. And, uh, and he did this proofs thing where he does this. Hey man, uh, it's like being in a band, you know. And I was like, okay, I'm in. And so we uh, we end up finding a, a basement club. We, we were looking out for different clubs to get to cheap that were cheap and would let us go in there and not you know take everything from us if we made any money. And this guy struck a deal with us but before. Literally, we'd pulled up in cars and we're waiting to go into the club, and he hadn't showed up yet. And an ambulance pulls up to this club, and. Oh, <laughs> They open, and these guys come out and they carry somebody out in a bag, kind of. And it was somebody who passed out in the club from a drug overdose, and they didn't find him until the cleaners got in in the morning. And it was like it was like it like in the producers, we all looked at, it, that's our Hitler, that's our space. <laughs> <laughs> so he said okay, and the guy gave us an okay deal. And there was already an improv group in there on like Wednesdays and uh, Saturdays, and so we took. Uh, like Friday and Sunday or something. And there was a little competition, uh, but they were old school. They were like the Robin Williams suspenders, like, oh, oh, the magic of improv, you know? And we, we loved Robin. He was a hero in San Francisco. But we said, how do we make ourselves different? So we were like madness. We had suits, ties. You know, I had hair then, and so it was, it was primed up. And, you know, we came on, and we did sketch and improv. And so it became popular. Somebody became very popular. We had a very talented cast of people in the group, very, very creative. And um, Dan Patterson, who's the producer whose line, was going around the major improv cities. San Francisco is one. And he picked me and Greg, and he told me he I got on whose line this way. He uh, asked me to go in. They said, do Star Wars. And so I, uh, I did Greedo. I did a translating improv where it's like, you know, I'm like, hey, nice pants. You know, I do this every and then probably do that like, like running line with your hand. And um, he cast me because he said uh, everybody else did the show. He goes, you're the only guy who did Greedo because I just love Greedo. Guy's got a butthole for a mouth. <laughs> um, and um, and so that's how I got in. And Greg got in merely because, well, he's Greg. And, you know, there's no question that he well, has. Um in Britain in the in the eighties, how how um, alien a concept was improv? Was it really really new then, or had it sort of like set in beforehand? Well, not to not to Americans, but to the British. Yeah. I was the 
what had happened is you had uh, Jim Sweeney and Steve Steen. They were the Wee Wees. They came out of, uh, they, you know, played at the Don Mar. And then the Comedy Store Players started. There was people before Sweeney and Steen. Um, mm -hmm. But when Mike, Michael Myers lived in London, the Canadian Michael Myers, you know, from SNL yeah. and all that. Um, and he met Neil Malarkey, and they they were kind of feeling the improv vibe. And like I said, the Keith Johnstone book came out. It mm -hmm. kind of was like that mix, you know. It's like television, computers, improv. Things happen across the spectrum in four or five different places with little things, and then it, it comes together, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so why they cast, because they were moving from – radio to television with it and what they felt then, which was maybe a little true then, it's not true at all now, is that American improvisers had a better grip on physicalizing an improv, whereas the British from the neck up were unbeatable with, you know, all the wordplay, um, all of that um, they had, but they you know, on stage were like Clive Anderson. Like, you know, that thing. <laughs> and, um, so as we were, which, you know, it's, that's a generalization too. You know, they played. So we went from TV, they wanted to have the best shot, right? So they brought some of us in and mm. and Greg and Colin and Ryan, we all hit with the audience, you know? And uh, there it is, you know? I, I worked, I, 88, 89, I would travel over and then 90, I moved because it was just, like, I was like, man, this is once a lifetime to live in England for a while. Yeah, let's do it, you know? You know? Uh Couple of who's line related questions have, have, have popped in. Uh, Sean Bailey always wanted to know why you and Steve Frost never did an episode of Who's Line together. Um, our eyebrows clashed. <laughs> that was it. We'd, we'd get together close, and they would reach to each other and link, and then you'd have to get somebody get this emollient to move them apart. Now, you know, I improvise with Steve a lot, Tom. I improvise with Steve Frost All Stars. Just mm. timing, probably because they had one big. American, and they had Steve Frosty, he was like one giant British, you know, monster. <laughs> and uh, they said, let's, you know, it'll be like matter and antimatter. The TV will go blank. But um, Frosty's great. I've seen, I remember I saw Steve Frosty and Andy Smart at the comedy store one time do a complete gibberish scene in Cockney where they just go, oh, and they just did like three or four minutes. I was losing its mind. And I'm thinking, I could be, this could be a music hall in 1885, you know, because they were all posturing and doing the, mm. you know, and I was just like, this is joyous. Steve is full of joy on stage. He's, you, you, you know, he's like a big drunken stoner board. Resistance is futile. He's just, you got, you get sucked into his world and it's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mark Prescott on Facebook um, was asking, how do you learn to do improv songs? Which is something that's intrigued me as well, because sort of the, the music games, I'm thinking, how the hell? Okay. Um, I, partly, I've had a knack for that. I have a rhyming, a bit of a rhyming knack since I was a kid. I just love sing song and rhyming. And I'm an only kid, so I would walk around the house making up songs about my dog or my food and you know, I'm adopted, so my parents were like, maybe this is a phase from his tribe. We'll grow out of it. And uh, I never did. And uh, I just kind of liked it, you know. And then I found that improv, you could do, play with that. And then I met Richard Ranch. I met Dr. Richard Ranch. Richard, his skill and his warmth and his wit, but, you know, and the one rule is I will generally will fall I'll follow him in the beginning and and find that bit. There's a an American uh, musical improviser named J. Raul Brody from San Francisco. And he was like Richard, his superb uh, mind of music and a very free mind of music. Uh -huh. And um, with him, I remember having great moments and not knowing exactly how I had them. But gradually realizing I'll follow him and then he'll follow me. And so the back and forth. And once you get that agreement, like an improv agreement, you know, your partner is making you look great. Basically, he makes me look good. And Josie, I would not have success on Whose Line with a song if it was not for Josie Lawrence and Dr. Richard Branch. That's just it. And I call him Dr. Richard Branch because I don't know if anybody knows this. Richard was the youngest lecturing Don in, I think, silicon or physics 
at Cambridge when we were doing Who's Line. Wow, really? The dude is... I, I did not know that. There's nobody like him. And he's he's a, he's a he's a sweet, complicated man, with sweet being the first thing, and a genius guy. And uh, so, yeah, honestly, I, he gets tired of me saying I owe my success to him, but it's, it's the freaking truth. You got to, you know, it is a collaborative game. And, and I, you know, I, that's one of the appeals of, of being an actor to me. I love getting into the crew of people and you find something and you don't knock each other out of the way. You both run together. A couple of years ago in LA, there's a lot of um, art in LA on the street, i.e. garbage. Um, and I've seen two examples of the best uh, mattress art where somebody took it with mattress from a flat that somebody had gotten rid of and took a spray can of paint and like drew something on it. And one was really cynical. And it was like a, an outline of a skyline of LA. And then somebody wrote, LA is my ashtray. And I went, ooh, he's angry. And then one day I was, this one hit me because I was feeling really self-conscious about being an actor, being older and like, oh, when am I going to go with this, you know? And, um, you know, why am I doing this kind of crap? And their guide sprayed on a mattress. If you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, go with the group. And I went, yeah, bro, that's good. I'll take that. And I, I you know, so that mattress is my guru. That's a stained mattress is my guru. I say that was on a mattress. That's yeah. that me. That's yeah. awesome. That we're yeah. we're way behind with graffiti in the UK. It seems like it's that, that's oh the next no trend. no no no. What is it? To the, I got one that was I saw in Camden. What is it? To the gallows with the Vatican shirt lifters. <laughs> what the hell is that? I don't know what it is, but I love it. That's fantastic. Uh, Daniel Lyth uh, on YouTube uh, again um, seems to have been um, quite terrified by the thought of the hoedown. Uh, but it says, on whose line, what was your favorite slash least favorite game? Um, my favorite game is Alphabet Scene. Um, and I did one with Tony. I had Tony Slatter I had like the time of my life doing because we were just getting to know each other. And he's just like a little kid, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, wrapped in like this handsome monster of a guy. So I love that. And it, it, just like everybody else, we all hate hoedown. We just. Huh. Well, it's about the hoedown that. that... Doom, doom, and we have to like, doom, 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 bum, 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 bum. you know, it's, it's, just, yeah. it's just, you know, it just, and I think we also just took on a group hate after, after uh, Colin, you know, decried it and Greg decried it and, you know, and then Ryan were all like, why are we doing this? You know, and uh, Dan Patterson's like, they're kind of funny. It's like, to you, disembodied <laughs> this bag in the booth, it is. But all the rest of us, it's like, uh, you know, and this one where you look, you get a payback from the audience where they're, oh, my, this is great. You know, they're out there and you're playing with them. And, and uh, the hotel was always more people were like, it's at, towards the end of the show, the evening, they're tired and they're like, yeah. <laughs> and so you're like doing, you're going, this is like not, this is, we're not getting anything back anymore, you know. Uh, so we were, um, so before we, before we came on air, we're talking a little bit about who's line. And you said that that, that's where you found out one of your favorite British expressions, slaphead. Thanks to yes. Clive Anderson. Are there any other British expressions that are stuck in your mind? Well, you do a quick catch up on British culture. You know, you mm -hmm. find out that Twiglets is funny, that Leamington Spa is funny, that, you know, those kind of things. Um, what you what you say, you know, da, da, da. hey, I'm Charles from Leamington Spa. It gets a laugh, laugh and you go. Why is that funny? Then you look it up and it's a suburb and you get the idea that it's a suburban values that your, your culture has within its language set and dialects ways to figure people on. Ellen Bennett obviously has gone and had an item about this concept. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, you kind of go, Oh man, you know, we're big and spread out with large pieces of land where we didn't have anything in the way, but with all the bogs and fens and, and hills and dales of your country, people could grow up a kilometer for each other and never see each other. In some situations, uh -huh. their language said in the mores and everything, uh, mores, mores, the mores, the more eels which lived in the village, the mores would come out, would, would develop. Um, and then I got help from Paul Merton. But Paul, because I did like British comedy, and I had this weird obtuse. I grew up in Kansas, and there was a record store that was owned by 
uh, Ed Asner's brother, who was an old stoner. And so, but they had these weird, they had Hawkwind, and they had an, a, and this guy who was a, he sang these weird songs, his name was Ivor Cutler. And, and believe it or not, in the 70s, there was a group of us in Kansas, a couple of stoners, who would listen to Ivor Cutler and like laugh. And um, a group called Hatfield in the North. So this really weird prog stuff, King Crimson. So I had an affinity for certain things. So for TV, I mean, first time I ever saw, uh, I saw Marty Feldman when I was a kid before, uh, uh, Python. But the opening credits for Mar Marty Feldman's Comedy Machine were done by um, Terry Gilliam. And so the the cutout, the, the you know that stuff was, and then his attitude and Marty Feldman was a genius that way, and the sort of like silent film comedy. But you know, I remember being a kid watching how Kings um, uh, uh, created their 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 uh, kingdoms, and they did it like a natural history. And so there was a, a woman sitting dressed as a lady with a big you know medieval hat on, sitting like a bird, and Marty Feldman comes out of the crown, like you know tipped over his eye, and a big cloak. Walking around like a bird, <laughs> he sees him, and, he, and I was just like, "What the hell is this?" You know, <laughs> it was like I've never seen anything like that. And so, on top of that, like I said, Paul said, "Oh, well, you don't know about Tony Hancock. You don't know about this." You know, and it wasn't like you know, he's not. That's great. Again, Paul's like, "Holy, he is a genius mind, but very inclusive soul." Oh, you don't know this, and he gets excited, and he wants to show you little titch, and he wants to show you music hall, and you know, and he wants to give this to you, and he's. The guy is full of gifts. You know, that reserve he has, which he uses, is actually, you know, he, probably, he hides a, a great sweet kid, you know? And so all you got to do is like, just say, um, you know, who are the Huggets? And he goes, oh, the Huggets. And he'll go off on, the, you know, these this early movie series with actors because I was a big fan of The Christmas Carol with Alistair Sims when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And then um, the people who played the Huggets are in that as different characters. So you connect all these things and you realize how small and brilliant, you know, post-war film was and pre-war film was in England. And then further on down with Paul, he did his, his uh, History of Silent Film, which made a case for – America only developed the silent film in Hollywood because of the war that the materials and resources and attention in Europe was taken up. Um, and that's really, you know, a lot of American silent film is from, oh, no, no. I go, dude, come on. If you read, you know, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, a lot of history is developed on, like, if attention goes over here one way, you know, then something else happens here. It's just, you know, it's a balance. Um so yeah, I got a lot of. Uh, so, question just come in uh, from Mark P. Uh, who was your favorite actor, and did you ever get to work with them? You mean generally? Yeah, generally. And anyone that you're a fan of that you you, you got to work with? I would. I've worked with Brian Cranston, but that was on a sitcom. Oh, what um, sitcom? It was a sitcom I did called Brotherly Love um, with uh, Joey Lawrence and his two brothers. Um, and he was a guest star. This was before um, Malcolm in the Middle and everything. So he was a, a guest actor. Hmm. And we just got along really well. And then when I, I did Malcolm in the Middle, he came up to me, he goes, because uh, what was it? I did some, I played this guy, basically a Christopher Lloyd character. My character's name is Lloyd. And he's a, he's a pit stop mechanic in this garage, the loyal friend of the guy who had the garage who died. And he, now he works for the guy's son. And he like, a pissed off crew and during an accident, a tire flew out and hit him in the head. And so he's kind of not all there, you know? And so I had this sort of like, you know, he even did a Christopher Lloyd voice kind of whack. And I had this exchange of like, where I think I like something and it's actually a food. It's like a philosophical statement. I remember the punchline like, is like, exactly, oh no, it's a, it's a grocery cereal. It's a cereal. And he loved that line. And he, he, he said it back to me. You remembered that? And yeah, he's and again he's you know so, oh I'd love to get in. and then watching Breaking Bad I was like, dude, and, and if you're an older character actor guy, because that without any disrespect to him, I don't think you would take it. Being a character actor is great. You get more width, uh, and you don't have to carry the movie. Where but in the case when you're a character actor and you have to carry the movie, then a guy like Brian Cranston is, you know, he's a gift. He's a gift, and he's got a nice, you know. He's just, will, yeah. So he's got that dynamic. And so if you get a good script with a guy like him, it's like, yeah. You know? And I got to work with Gilgood. I got to work with a lot of great actors. Fantastic. I got to work with Alan, you know, on Robin Hood. 
So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of blessed. I mean, I think if, if I, any actor I'd really like to work with right now, actually, um, Robert Pattinson. Right. What's, what, what's appealing about Robert Pattinson to you? Because he's such a wonderful film actor. And he's, he's got a, you know, this thing concentrates on so much of this on the screen and changes it, you know, um, and and he's got a nice, open, hollow stillness. And for me, because I'm, all, you know, I'm all, I'm quite Baroque, is to meet someone and then see if a script can meet the Baroque in that, or whether you as a, as a, as a, in a co-scene can find that bridge where your two energies meet. And so he would be a challenge, but I, and I've, listened, I've read what he's talking about, just like his head about being an actor. You know, and Gary Oldman. I like with Gary Oldman. Um, okay. uh, final, final question. Got time for one uh, more viewer question uh, before we go wrap it up. Uh, from Stephen Bailey. Uh, it says, do you have any memories from the set of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves? Uh, um, oh, many, many. Um, first day on the set, my first big role in a film. I'm a theater actor primarily, you know, an improviser. So I'm like, I'm on the set going, and by 3 p.m. I was like, here at 5 a.m. And Morgan Freeman and Alan Rickman saw that. They went, come here. And Morgan Freeman goes, when you go back home tonight, get a book that has nothing, nothing to do with this show. Okay? Sit, you know, and just read the book. He goes, because I was like, but he goes, you've got the job. You've got the job. And you could even do it badly and they won't fire you because I've already spent the money. Because you'd have to be really terrible for them to fire you. Because that's the great thing about film. You're already too far in on the first day. They can't get rid of you. It's like, what? <laughs> it's great attitude about it. And um, and also that um, him and Alan both, and you know, everybody was great, but those guys kind of took care of me. I'd go in the makeup trailer and Alan would be sitting there going, so Michael, what part of England are you from today? Because my dialect, I'm like, all right, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> he was like, just doing <laughs> shit. And, uh, and uh, during one scene with like the chase where he's being, we're like running through the, the, the warren of the doors. He was the director, he goes, can we do one of these? Like, a, I, he opens the door and there's nobody there. He opens, and I go and I open the door, there's nobody there. And then we open it at once and we're both there. We go, ah! and then to close it. And, and the camera Reynolds goes, no, he goes, Oh, come on, because he just wants to be stupid, you know. <laughs> he's just man, please, he's great villains, and just like goes, oh, you know. And then they said, Um, we had this scene between you and Azim, and it's not really working. Um, you're an improviser, yeah. Will you guys improvise a scene? I'm like, and you'll well, that'd be a great idea. Yes, let's improvise a scene. And um, we did, we improvised a scene, and he was really great, he was a lot of fun. Last one. My wife, who is not an actor, last when the Carcassonne scene is stormed, the Carcassonne, the castle stormed. We used the uh, the set at Shepperton, and then we went to France for three days to shoot exteriors at Carcassonne in the south of France. My wife came with me, um, and during a point, they Mary Elizabeth asked Antonio had a, a mid long shot, but she'd been wrapped. She's done. She's back in L.A. So they said, no problem. We're going to get a stunt woman to do it, and they brought the stunt woman in who looked like Ronnie Corbin. And they're like, mm, no, that does not look like Mary Elizabeth Pastor Antonio. And at that time, my wife was the same shape and size as Mary Elizabeth. And Alan goes, well, why doesn't she play Maid Mary? It'd be fun. And so they dolled my wife up in the wig and the outfit. And she got to do scenes. And she had to be like, you know, the Cheryl Nottingham's dragging Mary Mary in. And they dubbed Mary Elizabeth going, Robin, help! And a customer shot of that happening and cussed back to the reaction. And she was like laid in and really, you know, Karen's really strong. And and the cut, he goes, don't, don't fight me so much. <laughs> so she's like, oh, okay. And then she pulled her back up. To, she was so nervous, I think. So they spent the next like two days in the hotel room watching French Jeopardy, which she had a lot of fun. And then, <laughs> and then Alan took us out and got us really drunk. And then we were trapped in the city, in medieval city, with tiny, you know, we couldn't go to the the, the the lot, video lot, because it was a little too far away. And it was really cold, bristling up there. And Morgan Freeman was sitting next to Karen, and they were just doing jokes and stuff. And he was, he was just, those two guys were so bloody gracious to me and to Karen. So, you know, those are my some of my favorite memories. And okay, Fantastic. last one. Fantastic. You got one more? Yeah, go, yeah, go for it, go for it. All right. 
we get done shooting. I'm wrapped. You know, you think, like, Mike McShane, everybody stand up. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And you go back. He goes, we can't get you to the trailer. So you might walk. So I'm in my fire truck here. So I'm walking around this medieval city. And I'll see this guy who lives in Carcassonne, this French gentleman, French guy. And he goes, uh, Monsieur, are you a film? I go, yes, I, I, I play Friar Tuck. He goes, oh, Père Touk, Père Touk, huh? uh, would you like a brandy? And I'm like, well, I am playing for a duck. So he goes into his little, like, let's get this thing. He pours me a brandy and he goes, Oh, you must meet my friend Stefan. And so he takes me a thing. And Stefan goes to a little bar and he goes, Ah, have a, have a brandy. So I'm three brandies in. And then Stefan goes, Would you like some hashish? And I'm like, What? <laughs> and so now I'm drunk and I'm stoned. In the back of my mind, going, I'm wrapped, I'm done. But in film, you never know. I was like, like, hey, Mike, we need you for a. And you know, they wrote a speech. And you're like, all the time, we're going, please, God, no, please, please don't call me and I'll, you know, I'll die. It's like, don't work, I don't work on high. And I was like, oh, my God. So now I'm paranoid and slightly drunk. And I was like, okay, nobody's talking. And then they said, would you like show you around? I'm like, yeah. And these guys walked in, they grew up there. And they would talk and they go, ah, we would play as you, you know, cowboys and Indians. We played uh, crusaders and moors on the parapets with these little wooden swords. And I'm like, this is beautiful. I mean, this is fantastic. It gives me, you know, I've, I've been so lucky to get into corners. And so that those are my fondest memories. Fantastic. Well, uh, my, um, this has gone far too quickly. We've unfortunately reached the end of, end of the time. Well, well, so this has gone on far too long. Please. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Mike will be back with us slightly later on tonight. He's our special guest on Improper Provocateur uh, at 9 p.m. Uh, I've, I've, I've got to roll credits and then leg it because my next show is straight next after this. So okay, uh, Please donate, guys. Please. Yes, yes. Donate. That is the link right there at the bottom. The, the QR Thank code you. is in the credits. Uh, up next, awkward question time with me and special guest Robin Inson, Toby Haydock. Oh, Mike, man. I shall see you later for Improper Talk. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>